So perhaps you have a Windows 8 machine or a Windows 10 machine and you're interested in doing native backups for the sake of uh, minimizing the size of these videos, I highly recommend you first head over to the notes in this um, description and there I'll have a link to the Windows 7 native backups series and the first chapters will be a, a general introduction to the environment, um, how to navigate around in the video, in the, all the videos, um, the, the environment that it's been set up with respect to virtualization, if you're interested in that, and then a description about files, folders, directories, and libraries. Um, also, a, an explanation of the difference between drives, partitions, and relevant to the type of firmware your machine, a BIOS or a UEFI. And lastly, the difference between file backups and system backups. After you've finished going through those chapters, you can come back here to the relevant video and continue to watch it. Otherwise, we're just going to jump right in and you might get yourself a little bit confused. Okay, now it's time to move on to a Windows 10 machine. I originally mentioned a Windows 10 Enterprise machine in the first uh, few sections of this video series. Um, I've since then built a Windows 10 home machine that's a little more familiar with some people's machines. So this is a 10 home 64-bit, uh, I've given the computer name uh, something rational like 10 XP64 or X64 backup. And uh, let's have a look at the disk. Like the other tutorials, I've got a 100 gig, 100 gigabyte um, system partition, we can call it, disk zero. And uh, the operating system is here. And here's a system reserve partition, which I've left in place. I chose to leave it sort of default so that uh, this is a little more typical than, than uh, something I would do where I'd have a, a single partition including everything, uh, the operating system and the reserved and active partition and all that kind of stuff, but this is more typical. And then I do have a second disk, 100 gig, and that's where our backup data will live. I've also set up this machine so that I have um, a single user so far. This is uh, uh, my desktop. I've got stuff on my desktop, and you'll see that uh, there's a reference to stuff here. There's documents in the documents folder, obviously. I, I didn't put anything at download, that's okay. Got a few music albums and some pictures and some random videos. So very small but complete uh, environment for starting our backups. In the next chapter, we're gonna start doing the backups. Interestingly, Microsoft chose to include two backup utilities in Windows 10. I'm going to type start and go to backup settings. And you'll see the first is um, back, uh, uh, sorry, file history, which is right here. We'll get into configuration of that in a second. There's also um, the backup and restore that m came in from Windows 7. Um, the Windows 7 version of the tool, which is pretty good. This um, file history option up here does not include the uh, system information. It's only for files. That's why they call it file history. Whereas if you want to recover from a, a, a completely dead drive or something else like that, you would definitely need to use the Windows 7 backup and restore uh, feature that's linked to here. Let's go into details of each next. With Windows 10, there are two interfaces to file history. Yes, two interfaces. The first one is a very simplistic interface right here, which we'll touch in a second. And there's the second, which is under control panel, right here, file history. We'll see each, but first, let's start our first file history configuration. I'm going to go to add a drive, pick my D drive, 
and it automatically starts, which is something you probably don't want. You'll probably want to hit more options and you'll see, first of all, the frequency of backups. Everything is uh, small as 10 minutes all the way up to one day. I'll leave it on an hour. And then the retention period of your backups, how long you keep them for, could be forever, could be until space is needed. That implies that data is going to be deleted, probably the oldest data, or something in between. I'll leave it on forever for now. Now, there are some automatically created, automatically selected directories or folders, downloads, and desktop are included. If you're not a person to keep your desktop clean um, or your downloads folder clean, you might want to consider uh, cleaning them and not backing them up or be just be cautious. I'm, I'm not a person to keep too much stuff in the downloads directory and I'm pretty good at keeping stuff that is being worked on on the desktop. Eventually it lands in the more important area which is the documents folder. And the documents folder is going to be backed up on this machine. This mysterious one is, um, I, I'm not using OneDrive and that's what OneDrive looks like. Now, now that you've seen uh, the pre-selected directories or folders, um, you can also manually add a folder here if you wish. And then also you can manually exclude a folder, which seems kind of strange. If you, let's say, had gigabytes of pictures, and there might be one, for whatever reason, there might be one directory of pictures that's in the pictures folder that you just don't want to, to back up. You could exclude it here. It would still back up everything in pictures except that one folder. Now, if I wanted to stop the this backup utility, and use a different drive, I could do this. It won't delete, as it says, it won't delete any of the current backup files. It'll just stop using the drive, so you can configure it again. And then lastly, down here, well, there's two more buttons. Um, we'll do the restore later on. The advanced settings button is an interface to the file history, which is kind of nice. So now that we've hit everything we can in this simplistic file history, we're going to turn it on. And if you want to watch what's happening, if this should automatically start, but I'm going to click it and say back up now and wait for a few seconds for the backing up of our first part of our data, which is done. So that's our first file history backup configuration done and started. Let's configure file history from the control panel. It's a little bit different. It's off. I've cleaned it up so it's uh, starting from scratch. I first have to pick a drive. And then um, the default is to, there's actually no uh, option to pick directories. So uh, the libraries, desktop, contacts, and favorites are going to be picked automatically. Um, I can choose to exclude folders, um, and the only way of knowing what's excluded is to manually put it here. So, whoops, I would never want to exclude that. I meant to pick downloads. Downloads here. Save changes. So, unfortunately, this interface doesn't show you uh, everything. It just shows you what is going to be copied, um, but it doesn't show you the excluded folders, which is kind of sad. Um, if I went to turn it on, however, it will start and uh, the backup will occur. Now, it may be wise to not configure the file history using this interface and I'll show you why. I'm going to turn it off. I'm going to go to the beginning of all of this which is backup. Uh, 
I'm going to go to more options because I could have gone there a quicker way. I'm going to say stop using this drive. And let's pretend that we're starting all over again. Now, add a drive, the D drive, and of course, Windows doesn't seem to like doing that sometimes. Let's try it again. Good. We've been here before, we're gonna turn it off. And let's leave the um, frequency and retention period the same. Now, I want to not have downloads. And I want to not have desktop. And not have this, hopefully, OneDrive. Now I've got nothing specifically excluded. Okay, so I'm going to um, turn on the backups by going back one screen, turn it on, and do my first backup. So now by using the configuration this way, I see here what is being backed up and um, I have nothing excluded yet, right? So I'm gonna to go to advanced settings and look at it from the other environment. I don't see everything that's here. I, uh, it obviously is whatever was configured up here, but I don't see a very verbose list of what is being part of these backups. And I do not see what's excluded, which is kind of confusing. If I was to come over here to exclude a folder, and let's say I intentionally uh, got rid of the downloads. Let's make sure that it's gone here. So downloads is not part of this backup sequence. If I go here, it's still not visible here. However, it is <laughs> it's still not excluded. I may have to go to this and start it again. There. <laughs> For a second there, I thought I was going crazy. So it might be wiser to build your backup policy, let's say, based on the folders it's going to back up with the first interface. And then later on, you can use this interface to see some of the information that's going on. It's a little bit confusing. And I did find something that is not in the, the original native interface, which is under, uh, where was it? There. So under advanced settings, the uh, this interface does have access to the same information, the the frequency of, of copies and the, the duration of copies. However, the other one didn't have clean up versions. So if I was to clean up versions, I could go here and specify how old, um, uh, the cleaning up of fi files and folders older than a specific time, which would be really helpful. You do not see a clean up version uh, setting anywhere in this original one. So unfortunately, it's kind of a, a cluster of two configuration utilities to get uh, this particular file uh, backup, a file history tool to be properly configured and managed, but that's the way it is. All right, let's talk about data restoration from these file history backups. Well, first let's look where they land. They're currently writing to this backup uh, drive in a file history folder under the username Steve. The name of the computer, the configuration will stay away from. You don't need that. The data that we're looking at is in data. It's the C drive. And uh, our user is under users. That's me, Steve. And then these are all the files and folders that are backed up. Now I could, if I wanted to, come here and manually copy and paste, but that might be a little cumbersome. I could instead just simply use 
the backup GUI. The first is to go to more options and down to the bottom, which is restore files from a current backup. I could also have optionally been into the control panel file history and go to restore personal files. It is the same interface. From here I can go back and forth if I had multiple backups to look for a particular date when the backups were made. And then I can go to the individual file that I want, highlight that file, and then hit the restore button. In this situation the original file still exists so I'm going to be prompted for what I wanted to do. However, if the file didn't exist I would be happy to see my file back to where it originally started. Out of a point of interest, I could also restore them all with one simple click. Restore personal files and then highlight this one button of everything that it has. If I do that, it's going to prompt me for how many uh, items are going to be copied. And in this situation, it's giving me a warning that 220 of those items it's trying to copy already exist. So you want to be careful with these decisions. If this was a, a restoration from a, a dead machine, you probably wouldn't get any errors like this because your, your all important files are already uh, in your backups and soon to be written to your nice new disk. In the process of making this video, I got sidetracked onto a little OneDrive craze. And so I thought it would be necessary to show uh, a system with OneDrive configured and running and the implications on uh, file history as well. So um, the system here has its OneDrive configuration. If you're not familiar with the OneDrive configuration, I have a, another video with way too much detail on this. Uh, however, this, this OneDrive is, is currently running with the native settings. I haven't poked around with OneDrive, uninstalled it, tried to play with it. So this is what you would expect with a vanilla OneDrive install and Windows 10 Home, blah, 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 same, same operating system that I've been working with. And um, I'll just come here and you'll see that there's a quick access link to documents as you'd expect. Um, it's kind of hard to see where you're, where you are with this quick access because you don't know the pathway to the directories you're seeing here. Here's the desktop. You will see the path that's under OneDrive, and then the documents is under OneDrive, and the pictures is under OneDrive, which makes sense. Now these these links all over the place are kind of confusing for the average user because you don't know where you are. Now to demonstrate that strangeness, I can go to, uh, from the top level view, go to the users, let, and obviously OneDrive has got those locations there. Your files are there. However, it left behind uh, links to documents, which is not helpful at all, and pictures, which again is not helpful. These are both empty now that OneDrive is installed. Um, either way, I think it would be a good idea now to show you the implications on file history because this might have some kind of bearing on making backups depending on when you installed OneDrive. I can see a situation if you've started file history before installing OneDrive because you may not be backing up what you want to back up. Maybe OneDrive wasn't chosen. Maybe you hacked OneDrive out of the system and then managed to get OneDrive installed again. And who knows if you are, in fact, backing up your OneDrive location. This system here has a reference to OneDrive right here. That's brand new, right? Because I've, I've started the file history configuration after installing OneDrive. So it, by default, knew to, to start working with OneDrive. OneDrive. The, the uh, desktop is currently under OneDrive. You don't really see that, but you see the path to the desktop. The old pictures is still there, which is really confusing. And then uh, I have pictures and documents living under OneDrive.
and even camera roll. So yeah, the implications are kind of significant if you are planning to use OneDrive before and after say, uh, configuring up your file history. You better be careful with with respect to your configuration options and ensure the files you intend on backing up are in fact being backed up. You may want to copy your backups over the LAN and a protocol that's often used for sending those files over the LAN is called SMB, which is an acronym for Server Message Block. It's been around for a very long time in Windows operating systems. It, uh, some network people call it SMB, some call it shares, some call it file and print sharing. Uh, it also has name, a historical name of SIFS, or Common Internet File System. It's been around for a very long time, and it's been absolutely necessary for, uh, luckily, a, a very brilliant group of people have reverse engineered the proprietary nature of the server message block protocol, and they've released an open source version of it very many years ago called Samba. Samba offers the same functionality of Windows file and print sharing, or SMB, um, and it's uh, available as an open source protocol, um, and which makes it available under all kinds of other operating systems like Linux and uh, other Unix variants. So you'll see Samba or the, the, the ability to do shares um, available not just in Windows, but in Linux uh, appliances or network appliances, NASes, uh, free NAS, all kinds of stuff out there utilizes the capabilities of file and print sharing for free rather than having to be forced to use a Windows product. Now in this situation, I'm going to be using a Windows product to write out our shared information. This is These are the drives on a, on a machine that we're going to be writing to. I have already created a share called share and I'm going to go to the properties, go to sharing and then uh, stay away from this button. You get more control if you go to advanced sharing. I've already checked off share this folder. The default name uh, is the name of the directory. If I wanted to I can change it here if necessary. Um, it's important after creating the directory to actually adjust particular permissions. The everyone group, that's everybody on this system, has read permissions and then the very important uh, permission is a user on this system, and the name of the system by the way is zbook-vmhost, that's the name of the computer, and the user, Steve, has full control. So as soon as I check the full control option here, both change and read are also checked. So Steve has full permission to the share directory and anything underneath that share directory, which is what I want. So as Steve on other computer systems, I will be able to write to this directory and anything within it and read anything there as well. So that's how you set up a very quick overview of how to set up the SMB shares and the alternatives in a Windows 10 environment. Next, let's connect to this thing. Let's try to connect our file history to our newly created SMB share. I'll be honest with you, I found this interface to be a little bit clunky. Um, if I were to go to add a drive, I do not see any drive except the other physical drive that's inside of this machine. I don't see an ability to browse for a network share. And I've already tried a traditional mapping of a drive. It doesn't work either. So unfortunately, the only way that I've been able to get it going is this kind of clunky workaround. Is I have to go to se uh, select a drive, add a network location, and then here I'm going to specify the share name for my share. So it's the computer name, zbook-vm host, and you may have noticed I put two uh, slashes in front there. That's that's a convention, a normal convention for what's called a UNC path. Um, don't worry about it, just get the right slashes there. There's no colon, just two slashes and then the name of the computer. If I hit enter, I'll see the share that I've created. And then I've created a backups directory under there. 
and then this is the name of this computer that I plan on backing up. So I'll double click on this and then say select the folder. So far so good. I'm going to hit OK. Now it looks like it's configured. If I was to go back and come back to here again, I'll, if this thing will actually lose its configuration, which is really strange. I haven't even configured what gets backed up yet, but I found that I have to turn this on for a second, sort of commit the configuration, and then turn it off because I'm still not finished. It's kind of silly. I'm going to sort of refresh the backup utility by going here, starting it again, and hopefully it'll find... <laughs> now at least this looks partially configured. Then I go to more options. It's, as you can see, it's actually now configured to write to that directory. Now I actually go to set up my backup uh, files uh, the, the frequency and and duration period of the data. I can add the folders like we saw before. I'm going to wait to delete the desktop. I'm going to delete what we suspect is OneDrive, which we do have to play with. Did I? Yeah, got the right one. Okay, so here we go with uh, hopefully the directories that I want to um, to keep, and I, I can exclude specific folders if I need to. And that looks good. Now, if I were to go back, I think I can start it from this interface. Hopefully, it doesn't crash, which is great. And I could probably move forward to the sort of other view of this interface. Go to Advanced Settings and hopefully see here that it's working. So yeah, it's kind of a clunky way of setting up writing to an SMB share. And the next one will show a sort of a alternate way where um, we already have backups being written to a D drive, and then we're going to switch out over writing to uh, a network drive, uh, which might be simpler to do than, than this little workaround. I don't know. You'll have to determine it for yourself. It might be more convenient for you to configure your file backups using a LAN with an already existing pre-configured local backup. I'll go to the backup settings and show you what I mean. I've already pre-configured file history to write to the D drive. I've already set up my frequency, my retention period. I've got the directories that I want to back up already specified. I've also got the, the folders that I want to be excluded. And now that it's running, that's when I go to switch out to the network drive. So I'm going to go to select drive, add network location, put in the slashes, zbook vm host, the unc path to the share, go to backups, go to the directory I'm intending on writing to, hit select folder. Now when I hit OK, it's going to bug me that I have to possibly consider moving my existing files. This is a good idea to do so. We have already, we were making backups to this D drive, and now we've used this to circumvent the difficulty of trying to get it configured this way. We're going to now configure to write to this network share. I'll say yes to copying those files over, or moving those files over in this situation. The files will be gone from the D drive and then committed to the network share and the backup are going to then be written to the network share from this point forward. So there you go. There's a, an alternate way to get your file history written to a network share. All right, so you're in Windows 10. You've done your first uh, backup using the backup and restore tool from Windows 7, or that's been imported from Windows 7. There it is here. You can uh, double click that if you wanted to and get access to, to quite a bit of the interface. Um, you may want to have a look once in a while at the manage space icon, and here you will see uh, 
the space occupied by data file backups. These are obviously the desktop and pictures and stuff like that. And then the system image, the very important system image in case you need to get your system back from a, from a poor state. We'll do that in a while. There's other files, whatever they are. And the total amount of free space. So remember this, our backup drive is a hundred gigs and we're currently using up whatever percentage of that is. Um, now, if you wanted to, you could from here also uh, view and play with the amount of space uh, associated with the file backups. And in this situation, I just have one. Um, I could also go here and adjust the amount of free space used up by the system image. I could let Windows manage it manually, or I could uh, just keep only the latest system image. Now, if you are interested in actually recovering your uh, data, there's uh, two ways to get to it. I can't seem to go back from here. So I will click it one more time. Now actually recovering your data or restoring your data will be done, um, there's so many different situations you might be in, but you might be in a, a computer that's running and you just want to restore your files. And so there are two buttons here. There's one for restore my files. And when you launch it, it you see up here, it gives you uh, just restore files. Nothing else is written. You can manually browse for files or folders, picking a, a, a date of a previous backup if you want. So notice up here, restore files is, doesn't have the word advanced on it. When I click all user files, it does say advanced up there. We'll play with that to see what the implications are. Before we get any further though, I did want to show you that you can interface with some of these settings directly from the backup. We talked about this earlier. Here's our backup image, our backup file, and I can double click on that and then also access the restore my files restore files for all users. We saw those two just a moment ago. And then the manage space icon, which gets, gets you to here. So a couple of ways of getting to some of the same configuration settings. And the next one, let's actually do a restore. Let's say that for whatever reason, you've noticed that um, the files on your desktop and your documents and pictures and videos and even music are all missing. And luckily you have been doing backups. So, uh, and this situation, your machine is still configured to talk to that backup drive. We'll do a different scenario, a scenario where you have to tell it where your backups are. But right now we're just going to do a simple scenario, sort of demonstrating what it's like to restore uh, uh, either a file or all files. Now, uh, obviously we have to go to this area of the um, configuration and go, go to restore my files. And I could do individual files, but that would take forever. Oh, I should also mention I could choose a different date up here. If there were lots of backups, you could find a particular file or folder based on a date. But the default is to go to the latest version, which is applicable to here. So I'm going to say Browse for folders, double click on the backup of this drive. Obviously, I want stuff in users. I'm going to ignore the user mark. We're going to deal with mark in a little bit. But I'm, I'm Steve. And we have to do this one at a time. So I'm going to go through and first hit desktop, add folder. And unfortunately, I have to do this five times. Documents, add folder. Browse for folders. Uh, music, add folder. Browse for folders. I could have selected everything, but I don't know. I don't know the implications. I'd rather copy over. Oops, I didn't, shouldn't be talking at the same time. Just highlight the one directory and then hit that. And the last one is did I say music already? Uh, videos, add folder, desktop, documents, music, pictures, videos. 
Okay, could add more if I wanted to, but I'm just going to see the implications of doing these all important ones for me right now. I'm going to hit next. Now, I, by the way, I've already cleaned out all of these locations. There is a hidden file that will uh, we'll get a, a prompt for called the desktop.ini, but that's okay. When I hit next, it'll ask me, do I want to restore the files into their original location or put them somewhere else? In this situation, in the original location. Let's hit restore. And sure enough, we'll have some of these messages for the desktop.ini. I'll say copy and replace. I'm not going to say do this for all conflicts. I just want to count the number of times I see this. Four, five, so five times, which makes sense, right? There were five different uh, locations or directories. We got no errors, no messages, and no opportunity for viewing a log file, which is kind of cool. So we're done the restoration of all those critical files. Let's make sure we can see them all. Here's my stuff on my desktop. Great. We never played with downloads. I've got my documents back. I've got all my important pictures, my videos, and my cool music. So yeah, that's how to recover a system if files or an entire libraries have been missing. Um, and in this situation, it's a little unique because the configuration was already set up to know where your backups are. Let's do the exact same situation with a simulated fresh install where we'll have to tell it where the backup drive is. Now here's a restoration of a typical uh, scenario where you have your backup drive, um, but you've had to rebuild your operating system from scratch. And I've just re I've just installed, and I've just created my my user, and my user is is Steve on this system. I've attached just for the heck of it uh, the backup drive to a completely different drive letter as well, and I have nothing in all of my local files, local uh, library directories, so it's completely empty. And um, I also added a little bit of complexity here because not everybody has a single user system. I actually have a second user on this computer. Mark is a second user and I did that because my backups include uh, Mark as a, as a second user. So contained in the backup file um, are the contents, uh, are files for, for the user Mark. Now it's very important before you do your restoration to ensure that all the users on the system are, are obviously uh, created. And it's probably very important to ensure that the users have the same spelling of their name. So uh, Mark has been created with the, with the same uppercase um, M and Steve with the uppercase S. I don't know for sure, but I think it is case sensitive. I could be wrong on that, but just to be safe, make sure that your usernames have the same spelling. Um, if you made a mistake, let's say I put Steven here and I did a restore with my files, the restore is going to land in the, in the directory where they, they were they came from. So you might wind up with a funny situation. So just ensure that your users are they have the same spelling, the same name, and you'll be all good. So now here's our system ready to go to do our restore. Again, I've moved the backups over to the H drive just for the heck of it. Here's my backup file. So hopefully we have everything in order. Let's just go to backup. Oops, no, we don't want that. We want to go to control panel and get to the traditional Windows 7 backup. I'm going to change our view by the small icons and backup and restore for Windows 7. I obviously don't see my files, so I'm going to uh, click this button. And luckily, Windows actually finds the backup, even though it's on a different drive letter. It found the name of the backup, and I'm going to click Next. We can manually browse for files or folders and populate this manually. Uh, I can pick a different date. The current date is going to be chosen automatically. I'm going to do this. Select all files from this backup. 
it wipes out any manual selection options and I'm going to hit next. I've got options obviously to where they land. Do you want them to land where they originally came from, the original location, or perhaps a different location? We're going to hit restore. Let me close this down here. We're going to hit restore and we're going to start seeing some messages, some messages about copying and replacing existing files, the desktop.ini and other desktop files. There's plenty of them. Um, they're not visible to your normal view uh, preferences, but they still exist. And I'm going to say copy and replace. I'm not going to say do this for all conflicts because I'd like to see what's really happening. These are all every single directory or folder where uh, stuff is going to land has a desktop.ini. So you'll have to go with this message multiple times. I'm just going to take my time here. You'll see a bing.url. It's kind of a nice one. You'll see there's a, another desktop.ini, some links. And pretty soon, whatever that is, a search. These are all cool. Don't worry about it. Now there goes my important files to where they should land. And now we're moved on to Mark and his stuff. So the same kind of desktop.ini files. Just moving right along. Don't worry, this is perfectly normal. And then a kind of a cryptic message. Some files might be restored in a different user folder. Um, yeah, I think that's because we had files that were going to two different user locations. Lastly, some programs or system files were skipped because they cannot be restored to the original location. To restore these files, try restoring the files again and select different locations, selecting a different location. Well, I don't know about that. I'm going to just simply open up this log file here and you'll note that uh, restore skipped restoring the file to the original location. It skipped, I'm assuming, because it existed and we're okay. I'm just going to use the page down button rapidly here and you'll see that they're all skipped. I don't see any other messages or bad messages. But just in case, while we have a chance, we might as well go through the log. So they're all just skipped messages, which sounds good to me. I'm going to click finish and then let's go through to validate if our data is still there. We've got our stuff on our desktop, nothing in downloads, documents, pictures, cool music, and videos. So that looks good. And now let's make sure that Mark's stuff is around from this level without logging in. I would just take a little bit longer for this video. Mark should have stuff on his desktop. Excellent. Documents. Uh, whoop, Mark. Nothing in downloads. I actually didn't start with any music files, so they're not there. And then pictures. Cool. And then videos. So fantastic. We have actually successfully restored critical files from backups on a fresh install including a multi-user system. So that worked out really good. I hope it helps you. All right, now the Windows 10 file history is pretty well all but settled. Let's get on to the next backup option in Windows 10, which is actually utilizing the Windows 7 backup and restore utility right here. You can also find the Windows 7 Backup and Restore Utility here. So, um, you'll probably notice that this is very similar to the Windows 7 because it is the same tool, uh, probably modernized for Windows 10, of course. Um, I'm going to pick the backup drive, the D drive here. I could optionally save on the network if I wanted to. I'm going to hit Next and I'm going to choose the options to be backed up. We've been here before. Do we want to have backups of any newly created users on the system? I'll say yes. 
do we want to have these directories picked automatically? I'll say yes in this case. Um, do I want to have additional locations? No, here we go with uh, the assumption of downloads and desktop in my situation. I would like to keep those kind of clean. Uh, you, your mileage may vary. And then last but not least, I can individually check uh, specific directories or folders using that checkbox. I'm going to uh, go back to here so I can see a grand view. So I've got uh, a majority of my libraries, newly created users, no other specific directories. And then the very important include a system image of the C drive. In this situation, two drives. It's even warning me here. It's going to do the, the system reserve partition and the C partition. If you recall, the operating system on this computer is made up of two partitions. A system image is going to be made um, and we can obviously use it to restore if the computer stops working. Let's hit next and then it's going to give us a summary of what's going to be done. Well, that's nice. No desktop, no downloads. Um, and the schedule, uh, which is interesting, is going to be every Sunday at 7. I could change the schedule now, which is kind of nice. The frequency daily, weekly, and monthly, day and the time. And you could just uncheck the schedule if you want. I'm going to leave it on. And um, it's warning us here that a system repair disk might be re required to restore the system image, which makes sense. And we'll get into the Windows 10 uh, system repair disk when it's necessary. But for now, I'm going to hit Save Settings and Run Backup. And we're just going to cross our fingers here that this backup goes quite well. And we'll come back to this video in a moment when it's done. Okay, so the backup is done. It didn't take very long on this machine. It says here the backup size is 13 gigabytes. And if we look on the D drive where the backups are being written, we'll see uh, two new entries. This first entry um, is the original file history. We can ignore that. That was made with the other part of this backup utility. This is, uh, we're now talking about the Windows 7 backup process. And it's made up of two portions. This is where the, the files were being written. Um, in uh, 10x64 backup. And I could optionally double click this and we've, we've seen this interface before. And then within Windows image backup are the files that make up the actual backup, uh, the actual system image, which you would not normally need to interface with here. We'll be using that or accessing that when, a, when we do a restore later on in this video series. It's important to understand what is being backed up in the system image before we get too far. I have a system here where the entire hard drive, it's a UEFI, uh, disk zero UEFI system. Um, you may have something similar, but uh, you, you'll have these partitions typically. We have an operating system partition, an EFI system partition, and a recovery partition in the beginning. The order of these might be different depending on your type of machine. Now on this machine, what I did was I intentionally shrunk the operating system partition to put in my own individual customized partition because it may or may not have bearing on what gets backed up and what gets restored to in terms of the backup environment. Let's look first at the machine that has not been touched. We'll go to backup. We have not done or prepared any backups yet for this machine. I just wanted to see what the interface would look like for the first time. I'm going to go to set a backup. I'm going to specify a different drive for the backups. If you recall, it's a totally different drive. Let me choose. And you'll see here, uh, if, if, left, if left checked, include a system image of the EFI system partition recovery and operating system. The EFI system partition recovery and the operating system. Let's have a look at the bearings of that with respect to the data partition on the other machine. 
So starting again, this is a machine with a customized shrunken C partition in a way, set back up. We're writing to the backups. I'm gonna let choose. And here, EFI system partition recovery and OS. It does not mention that it's going to include the D drive as part of the back of the, of the creation of the system, which is good. You th these three partitions here are critical to Windows, and in both situations, the system image is going to include those three, as it does in this situation here with with this one. Now, there is a uh, another place where this particular um, uh, partition will have bearing, and that is when you go to the creating of a system image from here. Okay, if I go to create a system image here and specify the uh, destination drive, you notice that these three partitions are going to be picked. They are critical. They're obviously the three that you need. If I go over to my sort of customized machine, I'll cancel out on this, go to create a system image, specify the destination. Notice here that EFI recovery and OS are obviously checked by default and data is optionally unchecked. I could include data as part of this backup if I wanted to. So the backup utility is intelligent enough to know what partitions are critical to the operating system. And if you've customized it like I have, it is intelligent enough to give you the option to check or uncheck any of your customized partitions. This is really important to pay attention to. Now let's talk about the creating of our recovery media. Windows 10 comes with two interfaces to the creating of recovery media. As you now know, there is the original Windows 7 backup and restore tool. If we were to click on that, there is a option here for the creating of a system repair disk, which we'll see soon. And then there is a second, newer version of the recovery media located in control panel here under recovery. This is a more modern way of creating recovery media. Each has its advantages and its disadvantages, and we'll have to go over each because there may be a scenario where you could use each. We'll do that next. Let's have a quick review of the computer's firmware, whether or not it's a BIOS firmware or a UEFI firmware, because it does have implications on one of the two types of recording recovery media that you're about to create. Here, I've uh, let you see that this is a Windows 10 x64 BIOS style of computer, and I've installed this operating system on an existing partition. So the operating system takes up the entire drive. There is a single partition and system boot page and all that are on a single partition. In comparison, I've let Windows 10 home install uh, and do its own thing on a clean empty drive and it went ahead and created a system reserve partition with the critical system files. It's active, it's a primary. This is also a primary. This is where the operating system is. So these are both BIOS style of firmware computers, one with a single partition, one with two partitions. You would not normally see this system reserve partition. It's, it's actually hidden from view. Now that's in comparison to a Windows 10 UEFI partition, a firmware uh, system. 
app, if you look at the disk management utility here, we'll see a 529 megabyte recovery partition, uh, EFI system partition, and then the operating system. The giveaway here that this is in fact a UEFI style firmware machine is the presence of a, of a partition somewhere in the system that says EFI. Now these are machines that I've built from scratch. Quite often you can see uh, a computer that was built by a manufacturer like Asus or Lenovo, and they come up with their own partitioning schemes. I've seen um, the recovery partition at the end a lot larger. They may have uh, their own stuff contained inside of the recovery partition for all kinds of other features. But um, if you're concerned about what type of machine you have and it's not really clear in your documentation, just look in the disk management and have a peek to see if you can see an EFI system partition. Chances are pretty good if you see something related to EFI, that is a UEFI style firmware. Now let's go over the implications of EFI or BIOS firmware with respect to the recovery media that we are about to create. It's time to create our Windows 10 recovery drive. I've intentionally put a USB key here on a physical system and uh, I've uh, formatted my key to the word blank. You might want to do the same. My key is, is empty of, of any data because it's going to be formatted through this process. I can get to the recovery drive process by either going to the control panel and hitting recovery, or I can just simply type recovery and then go to create a recovery drive. And then from here, I have two options. I'll close this down to get better focus. The creating of a recovery drive says, even if your PC can't start, you can use a recovery drive to reset it or use or uh, or troubleshoot problems. Now, if you back up system files to this drive, you'll also be able to use it to reinstall Windows. This is very effective. Now, currently the default settings is to back up system files to the recovery drive. With this checked off, it'll take a long time to build a USB key that you can use to reinstall Windows. It's a very useful thing to keep around. However, if you just want to create a recovery drive so that you can boot from the key and use it to recover from your system backups, then this is all you need to do. We're going to do this in this step, and then I'll show you the results of doing um, a, f a full larger disk next. We're just going to click next here wait for the system to scan the system for any drives. It found my blank drive. I'll hit next and it's warning me that everything on the drive will be deleted. If you have any personal files, they will be gone. So back them up, which is understandable. I'll hit create and I'll come back here in a few moments when this is done and we'll have a look at the disk. Okay, my rec recovery drive is ready. I'll hit finish. And I'll just have a quick peek at the files that are on there. It created a label of recovery. And then the size is actually fairly small. So it takes about two minutes to make 490 megabytes in size, which is very reasonable. Now, in a few moments, I'll show you what the results are of making a full recovery with the system files. They are quite significant in size difference. If you recall, the other option in creating this recovery drive is to choose and check off backup system files to the recovery drive. I've got both of those situations here. This is the recovery drive that I made without checking that option. And again, it's in the neighborhood of approximately 489 megabytes in size. Now, if I was to choose to that checkbox, this thing becomes 4.8 mega gigabytes in size, which is massive. It takes quite a long time to build this thing on a, on a slower system because of the speed, the transfer rate to the USB key. Now, uh, to 
for the purposes of doing a recovery using backups, you do not need to do the full uh, USB key using utilizing that, uh, including the system files. This key here is perfectly fine to act as a recovery USB key. If you wanted to do, however, a reinstallation from scratch, an actual reinstallation of Windows, this particular larger key actually includes all of the files to do that. It'd be a good idea to build one of each key and keep it around. One last thing before we move on to the next chapter is this recovery drive. If I have a look at it, it has files referencing EFI. And from the tests that I've done, this Windows 10 home environment creates a recovery drive, a recovery USB key that functions both in a UEFI firmware style of machine as well as in a BIOS firmware style of machine. So this one key will work in both. Now that we've created our recovery drive, let's talk about booting into Windows RE to access the recovery drive in a UEFI system, as well as testing our recovery drives on both a BIOS and a UEFI style firmware device. Before testing your newly created recovery drive, it's uh, going to be necessary to talk about some advanced uh, recovery drive options that are available on UEFI style firmware machines. The, um, this machine up here is a UEFI firmware and that's opposed to a BIOS style of firmware. So one way to access the, uh, the booting options with uh, the recovery environment is to hit reset this PC and then just go to restart now. And what it will do, this is assuming the, the Windows machine is functioning, it will boot the machine into um, Windows RE or Windows recovery environment. That's one way to get there. Another option, assuming the machine is running, is you hit the power button and then you hold down the shift key while hitting the restart button. So again, I'm holding the shift key and then I'm clicking the restart button and it will do the same thing booting into a Windows RE or Windows rescue environment. I'll wait for this to complete. Now you'll probably notice that there's a slight difference between these two and it does pertain to things related to booting. You do not have the options for booting devices in the BIOS style of firmware. If I go here to the UEFI style of firmware, I have the option for using a device. I'll click that again. And then you see mention of EFI. This is where you could go to boot your USB key or your uh, EFI created uh, ISO file, uh, or sorry, your uh, CD-ROM. It would also be in this list. You cannot access this sort of an option with a, an older BIOS style of system. So it does have the implications and it'd be a good idea to practice with this prior to um, using it in production. Let's test our Windows 10 BIOS firmware machine with our newly created uh, BIOS USB recovery media. In this situation, I'm going to do it virtually. It's not going to be identical to your environment, obviously. Um, with the key attached, you do have to get into your computer's BIOS. And there's going to be a certain key sequence to hit in order to do that. You might be lucky and your, your computer might have support for hitting a key that prompts you for uh, the manual selecting of different boot uh, drives that might be available as well. And that's a simpler way of doing it. But uh, assuming you can get into your BIOS and you will have to do this eventually, you can go over to hopefully somewhere in your BIOS you have something related to uh, changing the boot order. And in this situation, on this VM, VMware machine, I've, I've ensured that the removable device, which is in this situation uh, synonymous to a USB key, is simply above the hard drive. This is the order in which the system will boot. And if the USB drive is attached above 
the hard drive then it will boot from that hard uh, from that USB key which I'll do now it's a little trickier in uh, oops, in uh, VMware to try to make this happen but I won't bore you with the details here did I not hit the right thing exit saving changes yes so now I am booting and um, you won't know right away if it's working it looks like it's still booting windows it's the, sa it's the same splash screen but it will actually take uh, a significantly long uh, amount of time because of the usb speed and uh, so don't panic if you see a longer wait time if there chances are it actually is working i'll just wait here until the uh, the prompt for the keyboard selection comes up. Great, looks good. So the key has been completely booted and we have our selection for our keyboard layout. I'll pick US and pretty soon we're going to be accessing this uh, system image recovery because you're in this, that situation where you might want to boot from this key and access your system image recovery. So we're going to do that after we explore the UEFI firmware booting situation. Next. Now we're on a Windows 10 UEFI firmware style of machine and we've got our recovery drive attached and we're ready to use it. It's the same recovery drive type that you can use in a BIOS machine. Uh, I made a mistake in the previous chapter. It's the, it's the same as, as I have tested and are, am testing here. Now you need to boot uh, your machine into your firmware and uh, if you Sometimes when you turn on the computers, they boot so quickly you don't even get to see the buttons required to get into the BIOS or the UEFI. It's actually kind of tricky. Um, and if you, if you want, if, if Windows is functioning, you can actually get into your firmware from a UEFI style machine using the Reset This PC which we saw earlier. There's another interesting option that's included in the Windows Rescue Environment or Windows RE. That's what this is. This is Windows RE right now. And buried under Troubleshoot, under Advanced Options, is UEFI Firmware Settings. I'm going to click that and it's going to restart the computer and boot into the VMware UEFI Firmware. Some people still call this BIOS, but I distinguish the, them differently because they are different firmwares. Now, your machine's not going to look this simple. The UEFI uh, firmware that I've seen, they can, they can go from fairly simple, fancy graphics, all the way to really complex. You're going to have to read the documentation or carefully poke around to look for where you can find your USB key and select it as a boot option. I'm doing something here they never see being done in the real world. I'm, I'm using some VMware magic here to boot from my USB key. But you don't need to even concern yourself with what I selected there. I'll come back after this thing is booted. Okay, just after a few moments, um, I have the ability to choose my keyboard layout, and then pretty soon we're going to be going to troubleshoot, and then system image recovery. So there you go, booting a BIOS, style firmware machine with your key and booting your UEFI style of firmware machine with some better options to ultimately land to your system image recovery option in your key. So now it's time to actually do some heavy work with this key and do some system image recovery next. Okay, now it's time to start testing in production our Windows 10 recovery drives. Um, this particular machine is a UEFI style of machine. I'll show you that with the disk management utility. Here is disk zero, where my disk, uh, where my uh, partition lives for my operating system, which is C. And you'll see here that there is also an EFI system partition that indicates this is UEFI. And then we have a recovery partition here. The reason why I'm showing you this is there are three partitions. They're all working together. They're, they have to be done at the same time. And we'll see hints of that when we do our recovery. Now, 
You've been doing backups on your system, which is great, and you've been using the Windows 7 Backup and Restore, perhaps, and in there you've got system images. Or let's say that you've just been using the Create System Image option up here, and your backups are attached to the machine in there, and I've attached my recovery media that I've created. So now, for uh, for all intents and purposes, you, why would you be doing this? Let's say your system is just terribly slow. You've uh, had something happen to it, and sometimes troubleshooting problems uh, takes more time than it does just to simply recover from a, from a previously made backup. So if you're concerned about any data that you're going to lose, you would copy it off, and then you just simply recover from your previously made backup. Now, because this is a UEFI system, I can take advantage of some of this reset my PC, or reset this PC options. We'll do that here. I'm going to hit restart now. It's going to boot the computer into the, the built-in Windows RE environment. And we have two, uh, two ways to get to our USB device. One way is directly from this button here. This looks a little different than your machine, but one of your options here will be uh, it'll say the name of the key, you Kingston or whoever makes it, and it'll indicate that it is a USB key. You can pick that key from here. In my case, I've hotwired a USB key to a hard drive, so it kind of looks a little different. If I was to click this, it would boot from the USB key. There is another way to get in to be able to see your key, and that's under Advanced Options, which we'll do now. This will boot the machine into the UEFI firmware. Let's do that. Now this is a virtual machine. The UEFI firmware looks completely different than the million of images that you will see out there if you do a Google search on what UEFI firmware looks like. Uh, on your system, you'll have to browse around, hit the F8 key or something appropriate so that you can select your USB key. I'm going to be doing that now and hitting enter. I'll pause for a moment until we get to the keyboard selection screen. All right, so now we're ready to pick our US keyboard layout. We're going to go to, down to troubleshoot and then what we desire here is system image recovery. Now because Windows still exists on the system, it's going to ask us to choose a target, which is our Windows 10 machine. I'm going to not pick the latest image, just for the fun of it, I'm going to pick select a system image, browse for the backups, or it'll be there automatically, and then these are the backups that you've made, or I've made, and, and there's four of them. And you'll notice up here that there is mention of uh, these comma separated uh, values here. This is a EFI system partition, one of the partitions on my backup, and then this long gobbledygook thing, and then the C drive. So these three things make up the partitions that are in my backup. I have no choice but to select them all, but it's just there for reference. I'm going to click on next. I do not have the option to format and repartition the disk, which is understandable. And then under advanced options, if I wanted to, I can uncheck the automatic restart in case I needed to do some kind of post uh, maintenance. And then it will automatically check and update any disk error information. That sounds fine. I'm going to click next here. We'll be given one last chance to validate what we're about to do, and then a warning about if the restore process is interrupted, some options. We don't need, we're going to cross our fingers, we won't need those options. I'm going to click finish. We have one last warning here that what we're about to do is going to overwrite some of the information on this hard drive. I'll click on yes, and I'll pause for a few moments while the restore occurs. Okay, we're at, almost at the conclusion of our restoration. We'll have a bit of a conclusion with finishing restore, and then an option if you're around to stop the automatic restart. And uh, I'll just hit the restart now button, and I'll come back when the system is back up. Okay, our restoration is almost completed. My automatic logon should occur in the next few minutes and you will be wise to go through your system 
and ensure that the files that you were uh, hoping to be there are there. Um, if they were part of the backup, they will be uh, on the system now, but in case you made a, a difference between your backup and files you were expecting, it would be a good idea to, to look for them now. But now your system has actually been uh, restored from the backup to the time in which that backup was made. So it's necessary to do any any post maintenance, any patching, updating of software since that last backup was made. Now in the next video, let's go through the process of using the Windows 10 recovery drive to restore a machine where Windows is not working. Okay, so we're still on our UEFI style firmware machines and I have intentionally wiped out the contents of my C drive. So my C drive has no partition information on it now. And um, in that situation, because you won't be able to boot the machine and, get, and hit the reset my PC to gain access to booting from your recovery media or getting into your UEFI firmware. You will probably have to get into your UEFI firmware manually at the startup of your computer. And you'll have to refer to your documentation to find the appropriate key sequence to hit to get into your UEFI firmware. I've turned on my machine here and um, unfortunately in a virtual world trying to uh, do this little hack with booting the USB key assigned to a, a hard drive, it actually, I run into a, a strange little issue in trying to demonstrate uh, the recovery for you. Uh, but you won't have this problem. You would go into your UEFI firmware, hit the appropriate keys, and then boot from your USB key. I'm going to simulate the uh, the gaining of access to the recovery process with my uh, CD-ROM. You will not need to do this. So I'll just be hitting enter here. I'll hit uh, the required button to boot from the CD or DVD. You will not do that. You're going to be booting from your USB Windows 10 rescue drive. And in a few moments we'll be given the choice to pick our keyboard layout. And you'll notice that uh, uh, it may be a bit different because there is no uh, detected operating system on the system. It won't give me a chance to pick target. I'm going to hit troubleshoot. And then the, what we are interested in is gaining access to the system image recovery, which you will be doing yourself. We can also pick the latest system image again, or as we have been doing, browse our drive what our backup drive for our backups and you'll notice because there is no um, existing operating system on this on this machine the drive letter associated with backups was assigned C don't get confused with that that just happens to be the first available drive letter it, it will change in a few moments when I hit next, I'll see all of my backups. And as you recall, uh, my most recent backup has EFI system partition, the gobbledygook one, and C drive. That makes sense. Uh, format and repartition disks is not available to be uh, unchecked. It, it obviously has to format and repartition the disk, which makes sense. I'm going to click next and uh, we have one last chance to make a warning and notice there's no uh, prompt here for alternatives in case we run into problems, which is kind of interesting. I'll hit finish. One last chance to uh, to validate what we're going to do. I'll hit next and I'll pause until almost the process is done. Okay, a few moments ago it said restoring and then cleaning up and now it's uh, ready to do our automatic restart. I'll let that happen. I'll, actually, I'll force it. Hit restart now and pause until we look at our boot prompt screen. Okay, that looks great. I meant to say login prompt. Our automatic login is going to occur. This this backup has uh, been restored to the system. Now keep in mind this is for a system where the operating system was was completely gone. It's a, a, re, a reformat and reinstallation. It could be used to uh, do a reinstallation on a totally different disk if your original drive has died and there's no reason why you could not use this on a solid state disk in the case of an upgrade.
Now this was UEFI style of firmwares. It will be important to look at machines that have a BIOS firmware because we don't have the advantage of being able to get into the UEFI uh, style of environment um, on a BIOS style machine. We'll see that in a moment. Now we're ready to test our Windows 10 recovery media on a BIOS style of system. Let's have a look at the disk management layout on this system. It's very simple. I have a single partition where I chose, I created the partition prior to installing Windows and uh, Windows landed on a single partition. Your system might be slightly different. You might have a, a, a smaller 100 meg or something. Uh, partition in front of the operating system partition, but it doesn't matter. You do not see the evidence of an EFI partition, which is proof that this is a BIOS style of machine. Now you have been doing backups and you've got your backup drive attached to the machine. Let's validate that with uh, the backup Windows 7 back in restore environment. We can look at our managed space and see that we have a system image. Just like we did with our UEFI system, you might have created your system image with this option here. And lastly, we have our Windows 10 recovery drive attached to the machine. It's the same recovery drive for both UEFI and uh, BIOS firmware machines. Now, because it's a uh, this machine is a um, BIOS style machine, we can't get into the uh, booting of this key using uh, the reset this PC. We can still get into Windows RE using reset this PC. However, we will not be able to select booting from the USB key nor getting into the UEFI firmware because it's a totally different style of firmware. You could cheat and get access to system image recovery from here, but we really do want to test out uh, and in production the use of our, uh, our key, our USB key that's attached to the machine. So let's do that in production here. I'm going to shut the computer off and I'm going to power on the machine into my firmware. You'd have to do that with your machine to find out the appropriate key sequence to get into your uh, BIOS. And in my case, I have to do this little magic with VMware to associate this hot wired USB key to be above the hard drive. So now if things go correctly, I'm booting from my USB key now this is again from a working Windows. Let's say again it's been uh, running slow or it's got a virus or some kind of issue where uh, troubleshooting it is just not, um, not feasible. So you want to recover from your backups. So we'll boot from our Windows 10 recovery drive as we are now. And as we've seen with others, we just have to pick our keyboard layout. Whoops. And then system image recovery. I'll choose to select a system image manually. There's our backup drive as expected. And it's, it's on D now because C is being used. And um, our backup only has data for a C drive, which makes sense. Format repartition is not available, which is helpful, and we know. And then I'm going to click Next. We have our, our summary of what's going to happen and a little review if there's a process, if there's an issue, what we can do. I'm going to hit Finish. And then one last chance to confirm. I'll hit Yes. And I'll come back in a few minutes when this is almost done. Okay, the restore process is completed. We'll hit restart now and come back at the uh, conclusion of the boot up. Okay, so that looks healthy. We've recovered from our rescue media, from our recovery our system image using our Windows 10 recovery drive on a 
working computer, um, the better way to see this in full production is to be in a situation where the operating system is completely gone or unbootable. And we'll do that next. Okay, so here's the worst case scenario. You go to turn on your computer and boom, you get the operating system not found error. And um, that's pretty bad error if but you have your backups and you've attached your backup drive to your machine and you have your Windows 10 recovery drive. You pop that out and you attach it to your machine. And now what we need to do is boot into your computer's BIOS and set your uh, ability to boot from that key. We'll do that in a second. Okay, I've booted my machine up into my firmware, into my BIOS, and um, you'll be doing the same, hitting the right key sequence, going to the area where you choose the boot order, and you would be picking uh, USB above a hard drive if it's not already set there. You may not need to do this if you've already proactively made it so that it always boots the USB key above the hard drive, but um, it may be necessary for you to do it temporarily. Now, in my situation, I can't use USB keys with this little uh, VMware thing, so I am using the USB, um, uh, sorry, the CD-ROM, and that's no big deal. It looks the same, the interface is the same. I'm going to hit exit here and restart the computer, and now because there's no detected operating system, I did not get the prompt for hitting any key to boot from CD or DVD. And this would look identical to the booting of your Windows 10 recovery drive. So again, keyboard layout, troubleshoot, and system image recovery. Let's select a system image. Notice again, backup has been found and uh, assigned the first available drive letter, C, which makes sense. And that makes sense. Format and repartition is selected by default, which makes sense, makes sense, and a final review. Let's hit finish. Yes. Cross our fingers. Be back in a few minutes. Okay, restoration is complete. We'll hit the restart now. And we'll come back once again as uh, Windows uh, login has happened, hopefully. Okay, that looks great. So even in an event of a catastrophe with uh, an unbootable hard drive or an upgrade or whatever the situation is, if you cannot, if the operating system cannot be found, you can use your Windows 10 recovery drive to, on a BIOS machine to uh, boot and use your system image from backups and restore your system to the way it was when that backup was made. Now, you may have a need for the using the Windows 7 system repair disk uh, CD process. And so we're going to go over the creation of that um, rescue media, the ISO and USB key for uh, subsequent chapters next. Now let's create the rescue media for your computer. It's the same for both BIOS and UEFI type firmware. It's the same interface. We get to it by going to the Windows 7 Backup and Restore, and we say Create a System Repair Disk. Now, unfortunately, this utility will only write to physical media. And if your machine does not have a DVD or CD writer, you your only choice is to connect somehow, maybe over a share or a physical DVD uh, CD-ROM writer. Luckily, you can buy a USB connected style device fairly inexpensively. And having one of these around is probably not a bad idea in situations where you have a movie or some kind of media that you need to randomly read. On, unfortunately, modern computers don't seem to come with uh, a media reader like this. So unfortunately, that's the only way you can create the rescue media on the system. 
uh, essentially you just put your blank media inside of the machine, hit create disk, and it will create, it will prompt you actually to label it appropriately. I highly recommend you label it uh, and put BIOS or UEFI, assuming you know whether or not you have a, a BIOS firmware or a UEFI firmware. That's very important because it will have implications on using that media on the type of machine that you want in the future. So after the disk has been created, highly recommend you test it out. And in the next video, we will talk about how to create an ISO and ultimately a USB boot key from that media. Now that you've got your rescue media built, it's time to convert that physical CD into a file called an ISO. ISO is, is uh, an acronym for International Standards Organization and an ISO in terms of a CD-ROM or a DVD just means an image that is made from the original physical media and it winds up being a single file on your computer with a .ISO extension. There are several tools out there that you can use to create ISOs from physical media. A uh, popular tool is InfraRecorder. A very popular but fairly hefty application is called CDR Tools Front End or CDRTFE. My personal favorite is a tool called LCISO Creator, and I'll show you that right now. The LCISO Creator has a big advantage of being only 52 kilobytes in size which is pretty spectacular. I'm going to open LCISO Creator and it will automatically, hopefully, find your physical media that's installed in your system. And all you simply have to do is hit Create ISO and then specify a destination, directory, and file name for the file you're going to be creating. I'll just put Windows, or just put 10 here. And I will allow it to go. It's not normally this fast. It's not really reading a physical disk. It's actually reading a virtual disk uh, CD-ROM right now. But either way, it, it will be fairly quick on your system, creating a file of a certain size. When it's done, you can have a look at the file. Just right click on it and go to properties. And you'll see it's approximately 400 and some odd megabytes in size. So that's, um, the creation of an ISO file on my system here. I've gone ahead and created ISOs of both a BIOS type firmware and a UEFI type firmware. And I've had to do that because they're distinctly different and they behave in very different ways. Uh, I've done some experiments with trying to boot these machines uh, with the opposite side. So I've, I've tried to boot a, a BIOS machine with a UEFI and a UEFI with a BIOS ISO um, or media. And it's it's a little bit odd. The, the, the uh, patterns don't make sense. Although, if you have a look at the actual files themselves, if you were to look at the the CD-ROMs and compare the two, they actually do look the same. They have references. They both have references to EFI. Uh, and you would think that they're both identical, but they are in fact not. So it's important to label the media that you uh, originally burned to disk and then label the ISOs uh, correctly so that you know which ones you're using in the future. In the next video, we're actually going to convert this ISO file into a bootable EF, uh, USB key, which will be totally cool. Okay, so you've got your Windows 10 Rescue ISOs created, and you've labeled them, hopefully. What if you had a BIOS system, you gave it a label of BIOS somewhere to distinguish it from the UEFI type of ISO, because they are significantly different. And now you need to put them, those ISO files, into a USB key format. You've actually installed your USB key on your system, and that I recommend you 
remove all other keys just to be safe. And I have formatted my USB key so that it's ready to go, it's empty of information, move off anything you intend on keeping, and I've given it a label of blank. It's not necessary, but it is helpful to, to see it in the future. Now we're going to need a tool, and in my opinion, the ultimate tool for this kind of job is a tool called Rufus. It's found on rufus.ie, and it's a fairly small download, occupying only 1.1 megabytes in size. You do not need to install it. The main executable and the support files are sitting right there. So we're ready to go with Rufus. I'm going to launch Rufus, and I'm going to notice that it first automatically picked the uh, my F drive, my blank drive, which I see my label, so I'm safe on there. This tool will not format hard drives or USB hard drives unless you start monkeying around with any of the default settings, which I do not recommend. The next thing we have to pick is the ISO. So I'm going to select the ISO, and I've already browsed for the directory where my ISOs live. If I was to choose the UEFI ISO, it will automatically select the appropriate partition scheme and the target system. Automatically. If I was to hit start, this key would be able, would all of the information in this UEFI ISO would be transferred over to this key and it will be bootable on a UEFI style of firmware. However, if I had a BIOS firmware style of machine, I would have to pick the BIOS firmware ISO file. When I do that, it's mandatory that I come over here and I choose MBR, which chooses a target system of BIOS. Unfortunately, that's one thing you will have to do. If I was to hit start here, it will copy out the BIOS ISO files to this key, and this key will be bootable and usable on only a BIOS style of machine. So I hope that helps. What I'm going to do now is demonstrate the creation, whoops, I'm going to demonstrate the creation of the UEFI file. Got to flip back over to it. GPT. UEFI is the destination target. That's good. I'm going to click on start. One last warning that the key is going to be overwritten. I'll hit OK. I'll pause this video. Once this thing looks like it's starting. Yes, it's starting to write out. I'll pause this video and I'll come back at the conclusion and show you what the key looks like. Okay, so the key has been created. Down here is a little timestamp of how long it took. Two minutes and one second. That's perfect. Let's close it out. And let's have a look at the key. It's got a label of repair disk. And its size is approximately 472 megabytes. That's cool. I would highly recommend labeling this disk and give it a name that's rational and parking the disk. Uh, actually, not parking the disk right away. What we need to do now is test this disk and ensure that it is in fact bootable. You don't want to park it if it's not working. And we'll do that in the next few chapters. You now know how to create a Windows 7 repair disk for Windows 10, either using the original CD-ROM or converting it over to a USB key. Both are identical. In the next three videos, I'll go through the process of using the CD-ROM to do a recovery of different situations with Windows 10. The process is identical if you use the USB key or the CD-ROM. It does not matter. You would just simply have to tell your computer to boot from the appropriate device. We'll do that next. So there's a lot of different ways to interface with this record, uh, this uh, rescue media that you've created. I've simulated the installation of the rescue, the repair disk for Windows 10 64-bit. It's, it's in my virtual uh, CD-ROM player on this machine. And let's just say that in this situation, Windows is kind of running, but it's, it's not, it's not all that healthy. And um, 
this you might want to test your media and do a recovery you've already got your backup uh, drive installed and you want to use that backup to uh, as a source for restoring and you you want to blow away everything on this operating system and restore from a backup so let's do that I'm first going to shut the machine down and it's necessary for that because uh, and in your situation too you may need to go into the BIOS or your UEFI, which we'll talk about later, and actually go in to make adjustments to the BIOS so that you'll boot from the CD-ROM. Ignore that message. So I have a system here. There's my boot. This is totally going to be different than all other computers out there, but I have specified that the CD-ROM is above the hard drive. That's the most important thing. I'm going to use exit exit saving changes and I'm going to get ready to hit any key so that it will not still try to boot it won't skip past this one message here we'll see see that press any key to boot from the CD or DVD that's very important to hit that in time uh, it, otherwise it will only time out and uh, it'll continue to try to boot from your your hosed system so in this situation, we've booted up from the media successfully. I'm going to choose the language. I'm going to go to Troubleshoot, similar to what we saw in other videos. I'm going to go to System Image Recovery. The target is Windows 10, and it'll find the latest system image, which is recommended. You could optionally go through, as we've done before, manually go for a specific older image if we wanted to all the way back to a few days ago i'm not going to i'm picking the most current version and um, i have an option in this situation to format and repartition the discs and i'm going to do that uh, you'd still again have the option for excluding discs the interface is a little confusing what's not selected is the the first disk the disk zero which is the c drive that makes sense and then what is excluded is disk one the drive that contains our data so don't get confused there now we're going to format and repartition the disks however here we do have an option we may want to consider looking at it. Do you want to automatically restart this computer after restore is complete? If you want to do any sort of post maintenance, which in most situations you don't need to, you would uh, check that off. Um, and do you want to automatically check and update any disk error information? Those are same defaults and they are checked off by default. So I'm going to click next picking the date and time of the backup and then one last validation we're going to hit yes to that and I'm going to pause this to just prior to the reboot okay the restore is almost complete let it go here for a second the um, automatic rebooting is going to occur if you leave it alone it will uh, don't forget that uh, our CD-ROM is still in the player and uh, it will try to boot from the CD-ROM. However, I won't hit any key this time and it will bypass the booting of the CD-ROM and then boot into Windows instead. Hopefully I recovered Windows. So I'll just speed this process up by hitting restart now. Let's just keep an eye on the screen for that uh, uh, prompt, which we'll skip press any key so we will not press any key to boot from CD or DVD and now we're booting for the first time from our rescue rescued um, recovered operating system from backup Our login is set to automatic I think and let this log in here We'll just go in after logging in and just validate that our files are where they should be. And then we'll be satisfied with a restoration from a, from a computer that's pretend that was hosed for some reason. So we've got our stuff in our desktop, documents, pictures, music, and videos. 
So that's how we could recover from a situation where the the drive is virus infected or whatever using our rescue media. Now uh, let's go through the option of showing you how to essentially do the same thing from a working system without the rescue media. It's kind of helpful. There's another way to get to your recovery uh, environment from a working computer only and that's kind of hidden away. If you type recovery you'll see uh, this option here. You could find it in control panel if you look around for it. I'll hit R here to speed up the process. There's a couple other ways to land in this page. And this is assuming you have a working computer. So I'm going to uh, highlight this and check it. And it launches this page. And it's under advanced startup. There's multiple things here. It gets a little confusing. Advanced startup is an option for going in and starting up from a device or disk, such as a USB drive or DVD. We're not doing that, but uh, we're hitting this button. This button is also used for change Windows startup settings, which we're not doing. Or the third, restore Windows from a system image. So we're going to do this. This will restart your PC. So we'll hit restart now. It doesn't really restart your PC yet. What we're doing is going to troubleshoot, advanced options, and then we're going to go to system image recovery. Okay, so it's going to change your boot up options here and boot into system image recovery without the need for media. Okay, so now it's gonna restart the computer the computer is still going to try to reboot from the CD-ROM, which is default, but we're not hitting any buttons. Okay, that's important. Just let it boot normally. And now, as you can see, it's a little bit different. The computer is restarting to the same environment but without the need of creating that environment. This assumes your computer is working, so you still do need to have an emergency disk created just in case you don't have access to this. I'm going to put myself, myself, uh, my username and my password in here as requested. And now you've seen this, in, in, this uh, environment before. I'm going to select a system image just to prove that I can. I'm going to hit this. Pick the first. And I don't have an option here for excluding or formatting, which is kind of interesting, isn't it? I'm going to make sure my advance is set that way and hit next. And I get an, if there's an interruption, we're in trouble. Uh, if this happens, you can use the system repair disk to try to restore the computer again or attempt other methods and optionally create a system repair disk, which we've already done. But let's try this out. Let's see what happens. I'm going to hit finish. One last warning. And let's see if it starts. So far, so good. Sometimes it bombs out right away, but we're good. We're good in this situation. I'll come back to this when it's near done, and we'll recover. Okay, so this restore process is about done. It's a it's an identical restore process, resulting in the same reboot. I'm also going to not hit any key so as to cause the system to boot from CD or DVD. Everything's exactly the same as the last uh, recovery. This was just done from a machine without the rescue media that we had created. Now, I do not recommend not creating the rescue media because there's an assumption that your computer is working to the point where you can access this media and utilize it. You do not want to um, be in a situation where you have no rescue media for what is going to be our next test. The ultimate test is a system that has no operating system installed and we're going to do that next. Okay, worst case scenario, you've turned on your computer and instead of booting into Windows, you get this dreaded message operating system not found or something similar to that. And no matter what you do, you can't seem to get your operating system to boot. Well, 
you're lucky you have backups and you have your rescue media. So we're going to put our rescue media in the appropriate area. I'm just going to uh, simulate that here. It's a little different in a virtual world. I'm going to um, put my rescue media as a enabled and I should be able to just hit restart here. And it did not prompt me to hit any key to boot from the rescue media. Um, that's because there was no alternative. There was no working alternative to booting from the rescue media. So it just said, well, no point in hitting any key. This is the only way in. So that's cool. So we've booted from the rescue media. We're going to go back to our regular troubleshooting options. And so far so good. I'm going to pick the current backup and uh, format and repartition disks is actually checked off, which is necessary in this situation. And I'm going to click next and finish and say yes. So let's cross our fingers that this works. All right, we're almost done. couple more seconds. Automatic reboot. This is great. So this is like the worst case scenario. Your system could have been uh, hosed because of malware, virus. We're not hitting any key, by the way, on that. Uh, we're letting it boot from the operating system. <clears throat> malware, virus, or in a situation where you've upgraded. Let's say you have a backup and you want to um, put a different hard drive inside, a completely different hard drive, a uh, solid state drive, something like that. So this is a perfect uh, example of a totally, totally new installation in a way from your backups, which is really, really helpful. So let's just make sure that things log in properly. I've intentionally disconnected the network, so you'll see a new icon down here. But this, look, this looks fantastic. Let's just make sure our files are there just to prove things are cool. Still kind of coming up. Desktop stuff, documents, pictures, music, and videos. Awesome. From scratch. Totally saved it. Let's move on to our next part in a few moments. As you recall, when we created the recovery drive, the USB recovery drive from Windows 10, one of the options was to back up system files to the recovery drive. And what after quite a while, it will actually create a USB key that I've, I've intentionally labeled it differently. It's approximately 4.5 gigabytes in size. And you can use this USB key to do a reinstallation of Windows. And it's probably a very good idea to overview some of what you will see. I have to go to Reset in order to boot this system up. This is a UEFI system, so I will be able to take advantage of the UEFI firmware options that are built into this uh, firmware environment. I go to Troubleshoot, Advanced Options, and UEFI Firmware Settings. I'm going to restart the computer. And then I'll go down, in my situation, I'm going to go down and pick my key. You'll have to pick your key according to your UEFI firmware environment. I'll pause this until it boots up. Okay, our key is fully booted. I'll go to US, keyboard type, and the first option that I see that's kind of different is recover from a drive here. Now there are two more options beyond this. Let's read it and what figure out what it says. It says, do you want to fully clean your drive? When you remove your files, you can also clean the drive so that the files can't be recovered easily. This is more secure. It just takes longer. Okay, so we're going to be reinstalling. Both of these things will do a reinstallation. 
Um, one of them will just remove your files and one of them will fully clean the drive. What this implies is that um, when you delete a file in Windows, the file is actually not deleted. The space that the file occupied becomes available for any other file and eventually that space will be overwritten. That's why there are many undelete tools that exist out there and if you're if you're cautious and if you delete a file by accident and then run an undelete tool quite quickly you'll actually be able to recover a lot of your files. Now if you're keeping your PC don't worry about it just select remove my files. However if you're planning on recycling this PC by selecting this option it will actually do what's called a secure erase and all empty space will be overwritten with a certain pattern of ones and zeros so that there is no possibility of recovering data from that drive. So pick your option accordingly. Now we're going to have to flip over to a physical machine for the rest of this video. It's not possible to do this particular uh, section uh, virtually. So I'll just pause for a second and I'll hop over to another machine. Here's our Windows 10 machine. We're going to do a Windows 10 recovery drive reinstallation on. Let's just have a quick peek at it. I've got my recovery drive installed and ready to go. And I'm going to have a quick peek at the disk management just to get an idea of the partition layout. This machine has a 232 gigabyte SSD as disk zero. And I let Windows format Therefore, it created a system reserved partition of 579 megabytes and it left the rest of the disk to the operating system or the C drive, it being 232 gigabytes in size. This is a, obviously a BIOS system, so it will uh, look a little different if this was a UEFI system. Now what we're going to do is shut this machine down, do a reinstallation, and have a look at the partition layout after we're done. Okay, Windows 10 has been reinstalled using the Windows 10 recovery media and or the recovery drive and let's have a look with disk management at what has changed. As you can see, it's the same drive of course and same capacity, uh, but the first partition is called system and it's 100 megs in size. The second partition is the C drive, the Windows partition occupying 232 gigabytes. And then at the end, there's a 500 meg Windows RE tools, which um, is not normally labeled. Windows RE does live in certain situations. If you uh, look later on one of my videos on Windows RE, you'll see how to detect where the location of Windows RE. But what's interesting is uh, Microsoft has, has chosen to give it uh, a sign it a drive letter. So actually you can see uh, the Windows RE uh, as, a, as a partition you could probably write data to. Now, I don't know if this is a, a holdover from a mistake that I've made or if this is just the way it is with this particular media. Either way, uh, it's helpful to have a, a, a reinstall uh, media on USB key in case there is a, a sort of an emergency and that's what this video demonstrates if I find anything uh, that clarifies the presence of this Windows RE drive I will uh, update this video later so I hope this helps